Okay. Um, hi, everybody. So, um, welcome to the old school Lolita history and how to panel. And I just want to start off by apologizing um, just due to the tech setup I have. I am not able to see anybody's comments or questions while I have the slideshow running. Um, so if you could please save any quest particular questions that you have until the end, I'll, I'll shout it out when I can see them again um, and I'm ready to answer them. Um, anyways, so thank you again for coming. I really appreciate it. Um, for a little bit about me, my name is Simone or Purist Maiden, and I've been wearing Lolita since about 2006, and I've been pretty much obsessed with old school Lolita the whole time, and especially with the recent um, revival of old school trends, I wanted to present a panel um, kind of outlining not just the history and the basics, but also how to recreate old school looks with a particular focus on um, how you can get the look without having to troll whack old Mercari auctions at uh, five in the morning. <laughs> so, um, Let's get started. So um, as you probably know, Lolita um, started in Japan. <laughs> and I think, I guess I would argue um, that kind of the initial roots of Lolita are with a magazine called Olive that debuted in 1982. And the concept was of a, uh, pardon my shitty French, um, Lycine or what literally means in French, a, a high school student. But what they really meant was this exaggerated, romanticized kind of European prep school meets little house on the prairie look. Um, and Olive's style, it was a little all over the place. It encompassed not only, you know, the traditional like little house on the prairie on crack, natural K type layered pieces, um, but it also encompassed cute and preppy looks from brands like Vivienne Westwood and Milk. And it was one of the absolute most popular magazines in Japan in the late 1980s and early 90s and massively influential on teen style. And it wasn't just a style guide. It was a full-on lifestyle guide. If you've ever read um, Larm for a more modern comparison, I think they're kind of similar where they both outline, you know, the movies that the reader should be watching, the books that she should be reading, the food she should be eating, the types of trends that she should be following, the music she should be listening to, the whole shebang. And the, the culture that they were putting forth again was this very romanticized European focused culture. Um, and in 1989, all of it is followed by a magazine called Cutie. And Cutie focused a little bit more on Japanese fashion and Japanese brands. They really heavily promoted brands like Betty's Blue, Jane Marple, Milk, and Hardy. E. And um, fun fact, they are generally recognized as the founder of the street snap phenomenon. And Cutie in another, something that everybody may be familiar with, um, it was also really heavily associated with basically boy band fans <laughs> and um, music fans. So like later Gothic Lolita, it did have a very heavy musical association as well. And Olive was part of a larger trend in Japan at the time called the DC brand boom. DC brand literally means designer and character, but in a broader sense, it was this umbrella term for small designer led brands. Um, some of the brands, were called character brands because they had a character mascot. Betty Blue is an example. Betty's Blue is an example of this. But the mag the brands in Olive in particular were helmed by kind of these larger than life designers, um, and many of them were even named after the designers, like Keneko Isao, the designer of Pink House, who went on to found his own eponymous line, or um, Atsuki Nishi, who had, who I think most of the clothes in on this page are from. Um, they had more of the kind of prep school on crack look that I mentioned earlier. Um, and another fun fact, um, Isobi of Baby actually worked for them for many years before moving on to start Baby the Star Shine Bright in 1988. So all of is the beginning of this look, but, um, and they also featured 
Natural K, which is the trend most heavily associated with Pink House. Um, and I think there's kind of a conception that Natural K and Lolita maybe like share some vague origins but don't have a lot in common. But I think there are some of the trends from Natural K that you can see in older Lolita, like the custom prints. Um, the QP print that you can see here with the red and white was an especially popular design that they returned to many times over the years or the um, berries and ribbon and roses, I think on the other side is another custom print from them. Um, and as we get into the move out from the 80s and into the 90s, um, the brands that are already around and producing for Olive Style start shifting towards producing pieces for Lolita. Most of the early Lolita brands were founded in the 1970s or 80s. Milk and Shirley Temple being the first in the early 70s, AP following as a select shop or like a shop that carried other brands' clothing later. Um, Rural Poem was in the late 70s and they started as a kind of pink house knockoff brand before moving on to producing Lolita. Um, and then Emily Temple Cute, Jane Marple, Baby, and Hardy followed in the 80s. And by the early 1990s, these older brands were creating designs that are recognizable as modern Lolita. Um, Shirley Temple produced their first prints in the 1990s, um, generally fruit and flower themed or little bows. There was also custom lace. So you can see the beginnings of what would become Lolita fashion um, by the early 1990s. And um, designer, uh, the main designer of Metamorphose and now Physical Drop, Kuniko Kato, kind of corroborates this. She discusses in some of her older Facebook posts that she was already wearing Lolita by um, the early 1990s. And she'd already been wearing it for a few years before she decided to start her own brand. Um, and so here's also kind of an example of some of the brands that were producing natural clay clothes that shifted into producing Lolita. Um, I think the main example here is uh, Rural Poem or Ideal, the translations kind of vary. Um, and they they started off as just literally pink house knockoff brand with slightly lower price point and kind of more generic prints to pink houses, more detailed, unique prints. Um, and then they shifted into their own style, which was a little more like Victorian schoolgirl type situation and kind of edged into classic Lolita. You can see um, the design, the drawn designs on the right hand side are from their last collection that was released in 99. And these are like pretty close to what, you know, Victorian Maiden and Innocent World would have been making around the same time. Um, and so here's just a little, I think there's a misconception that Lolita started in 2001 with the publication of the Bibles, but by 1993, it was already, you know, an established fashion that had kind of its own rules and pieces. Um, so here are some images from a couple of issues of Cutie in 1993. Um, and most of these pieces are from Jane Marble and Milk. There's like a couple of other smaller brands mixed in here. Um, and the girl in the center upper uh, part of the slide is actually from Heart E, which is surprisingly one of the older Lolita brands out there. And they were really popular in the early 90s. Um, and so throughout the 90s, Lolita's popula popularity continued to grow as a result of various street snaps and style guides that were published. Fruits first hit the stands <laughs> in 1997. Um, and although the, the main author and photographer of Fruits notoriously hated Lolita fashion, he thought it was too brand and trend driven and that Lolita's were not original at all. And he has repeatedly groused that he really regrets popularizing Lolita fashion um, because he thinks it's kind of formulaic and basic. <laughs> um, but despite his personal feelings on the matter, um, Fruits undeniably brought Lolita to a whole new audience um, and photos of real life teens wearing Lolita brand items in their own coordinates really increased the fashion's profile and popularity. Kerouac, or Kara, as you probably know it, came along a year later. They published their first issue in 1998, and they really heavily featured Gothic and Lolita brand spreads and street snaps, and also like style and makeup guides so you could achieve the full head-to-toe look. Um, there were also pop culture figures who wore Lolita. Um, Mizuno Aoi and her previous band, which I think was called Fairy Tale, um, 
wore Lolita and all of her stage costumes were from various Lolita brands. Um, most of them are like Milk and Jane Marple. Um, I've included a photograph of her here on the slide. And this is actually a dress from a very small indie brand called Mari Sonoda that was like briefly active in the late 90s and early 2000s. Um, but I think it's a good, it gives you a good feel for not only what her style was, but the way that Lolita looked back in the 90s too, like mostly simple hair, very simple makeup. Um, the focus was largely on the dresses and the dresses were mostly non-print with lace and trim detailing. This one in particular has like some whack brick crack going on, it's A plus. <laughs> um, and so Lolita really, Lolita's popularity really starts to peak in the early 2000s um, with the publication of the Gothic Lolita Bible. And Mana initially pitched the Bible to the Kara editors as a spinoff um, to kind of capture the popularity of Gothic and Lolita fashion. And like all of before it, the Bible combined information about brand releases and shoots with how to achieve this look, tips, and there are also lifestyle spreads, um, like how you decorate your room. Like they did, they had a long running series where they would go around and interview famous Lolita models or singers and um, take pictures of their rooms and give you advice as to how you could achieve their room style. Um, and they also had a couple of like really gross, like top level disgusting recipes. Um, and then, you know, the Bible also kind of poked fun at itself. It did a spread in I think 2004, where it was, you know, the, the life of a Gothic Lolita. And she uh, woke up at midnight and ate pickled beets and spam before reading tarot and then going back to sleep before the sun rose. <laughs> um, and the Gothic, the Bible was kind of a, in like a positive feedback loop with singers and artists at the time. They featured writing from popular novelists like Novala Takamoto, um, art from popular Lolita artists. Um, and then they also used popular visual K artists who wore Lolita as models like Mana most famously, but also Moon Kana, Aya of Psycho Le Simu. Um, there are a couple spreads with the guy from Plastic Tree, whose name I can never remember, <laughs> and a few others. Um, and after the Bible was published in, uh, Lolita was kind of brought to, I think, the real peak of its popularity with the publication of Novella's Kamikaze Girls in 2002. Um, and a movie adaptation followed in 2004 that was massively popular and transformed Baby into one of the most iconic and popular brands. And then an English translation of the novel followed along in 2006. And generally, the style from this time period, from like 1999 to around 2005 or 2006, is what folks mean when they say old school. They're not usually, unfortunately, regrettably, <laughs> talking about 90s stuff, um, despite my, my love for gross 90s stuff. Um, and by this point, Lolita wasn't just one or two brands putting out the occasional piece. Um, Lolita was a, a established defined fashion with established defined substyles. And here's a couple of examples um, from 2003 and 2004 of what kind of the different stub styles look like. On the um, on the far on the farthest side in the sacks, um, there's a girl wearing metamorphos, and she's got more of a sweet look. Um, next to her is a scene of Momoko from Kamikaze Girls wearing baby. Um, and I think this kind of white lace, solid cotton look tends to be the look that people most heavily associate with old school fashion. Um, but it's really old school sweet. And then next to her, um, there's a Mary Magdalene ad from around 2004, so the same year that Kamikaze Girls came out. Um, and then on the far end, we have Mana in 2003. Um, and this is an example, I think, of what Gothic Lolita looked like around that time. Um, and so this is probably the part that everybody came for. How do you wear old school Lolita? Um, I want to preface this with a little bit of a disclaimer. What I'm about to say is not a hard, not like hard and defined rules. Old school, just like Lolita today, was massively varied. And I think in a way it was a little more varied because people were still testing the boundaries of the fashion, trying to figure out 
okay, what's Lolita? What's not Lolita? What can work? What doesn't? Um, and so there I have seen examples of like literally pretty much everything under the sun. Um, in old school, this, the tips I'm about to give are more of a, a starting point. If you are thinking, I like old school, but I don't really know what to do. Um, and I don't just want to like copy a coordinate out of an issue of Kara or whatever. Um, you want to kind of try to come up with your own thing. These are some rules of thumb that you can use um, when you're shopping or when you're coming up with your coordinates to try to try and nail the old school look um, the best you can. And also like at the end of the day, you know, like nobody's going to come to your house and yell at you for wearing old school wrong. Um, I, one of my favorite things about old school is I love combining older pieces with newer ones to kind of make, put a new spin on the fashion and um, bring a little, breathe a little bit of new life to it. Um, just as much as I love some of the older coordinates. I also like doing my own thing. So, you know, you do you. So um, I think the easiest starting point is with fabrics. And I think this is where people tend to go the most wrong when they're like, oh, I want to try old school, but I don't know how. Um, not just any old dress that you buy in black and white is old school. Um, and old school fabrics were generally plain and ha or had generic prints. Um, here on the slide, I've got examples of two older meta pieces. Um, and on the, the blueprint is a generic floral that baby meta AP and a handful of other brands all used um, in 2002 and 2003. And this was very common, like VM and AP used a lot of the same florals, things like that. Um, when there's custom prints, um, there, they, there were a few custom prints, I think during the old school period, but they tended to have limited colors and limited detail. It's not like today where the whole, um, the whole part of the fabric is designed and has printed details. Generally, the printing was concentrated towards the bottom where it had more complicated colors. When it didn't, when it was just one or two colors, it might have been an all over print. Um, but generally, it was not like every color in the rainbow. The prints would have like five or 10 colors tops. Um, generally, fabric tends to have a heavier drape. Um, so it tends to be a little bit a little bit thicker and instead of being kind of the traditional poly chiffon. Um, and while there were a few custom prints, mostly from like Shirley Temple, Milk, Jane Marple, the brands that had been around for longer, um, what was more common was like screen prints or felt appliques um, sewn on. And on the black print here is an example of a screen print from Meta circa 2002. And brands also, for some inexplicable reason, didn't do custom prints they did do custom woven gobelin with like extremely detailed and intricate designs. I have no idea why we got that in 2004 and I can't get a custom gobelin to save my life today. <laughs> but that's how it'd be like that. Um, and I think there is a big misconception that polyester is somehow incompatible with old school. This is totally false. Um, there were a lot of brands that produced cotton items, that is true. But polyester was extremely common. Um, all of the major brands produced some type of poly piece. Um, but the polyester tended to be very different than the poly chiffon that everybody loves to hate on today. Um, the modern sheer poly chiffon or the lightweight polyester print was extremely uncommon to the point where I probably have only seen one piece in that fabric and it was non-printed. Um, poly solids were generally like a heavy, thick fabric. I've shared an example of this on the right from a 2002 Kazuko's Ogawa OP. And um, it's almost like a double knit, like think ugly 70s pants. <laughs> um, and then shears tended to be a Georgette or a kind of hard tool, you know, the material um, that AP uses for their interior petticoats um, or organza. Um, the soft chiffon just wasn't a thing. And it, like that was not common in fashion generally in 2000. So, you know, holds up. Um, and I think 
lace next to fabric for me is the second most important part. Um, the type of modern embroidered tool lace that basically every brand puts out today was not common at all. And I think for me, that is the easiest way to like look at a dress and be like, oh, that's new, um, is if there's that modern embroidered dot chiffon. Um, lace was generally also in basic colors, like white, black, or cream. Um, some brands did dye lace to match the dress for a monochrome look, but that was generally an exception and not the rule. Um, generally, the most common types of lace were eyelet lace. Usually it was kind of fancier, but not custom necessarily. Um, torchon lace, which is the kind of crochet-ish lace that baby uses. And then bobbin lace, um, which you can see up on the top of this image here in pink. Um, that's an example of an Emily Temple cute dress using bobbin lace. But that was not the most common. I think the most common tended to be um, eyelet lace on the bottom and then the torchon lace, which I have displayed here in black. Rochelle lace was, mm, it was mostly meta. <laughs> so, um, which is not a bad thing, but that is what it is. Um, other trim was also common um, because custom prints were much less common and much less detailed. A lot of brands instead went hard on constructed detailing. So things like ruffles, pleated trim, ribbon trim, pin tucks, corset lacing, felt appliques, those were significantly more common. Um, here on the, with the black and white print as an example of a felt applique that's got some pin tucks going on from AP. On the other side, we have some matching ruffles and then ribbon trim from Metamorphose. And those are some very typical to the period details. So if you're you know, on the prowl for an old school style dress and you're not sure what to buy, you really cannot go wrong with a dress that just has a couple of ruffles and pin tucks. Um, those generally tend to read as very old school, um, regard as long as the fabric, like I said, is a little is not the poly chiffon and has a little bit more structure and body to it. Um, next, I think silhouette. This to me is like you know, there's like a list of things that are important for being old school. Silhouette's like pretty far down on the bottom. Um, in old school, because it was more of an experimental time period there were all kinds of silhouettes. Like you've got, this is when VM started doing their mermaid fishtail skirts. Um, brands made a lot of circle skirts, mini skirts. It, it, pretty much any length was fine. Pretty much any shape is fine. But in general, the most common tended to be a trapezoid skirt, like this one I've shown for Meta, where it doesn't have much volume on the top and expands as you get towards the bottom. Um, there were lots of circle skirts and people who were on Live Journal in 2006 will remember the square dancing patterns. <laughs> and then um, rectangle skirts were common, but they didn't have the same volume they do now. Um, petticoats have been steadily kind of inflating over the last couple of decades. And the big ultimate AP cupcake poof was just not a silhouette that you would have seen back then. Um, if you want to start getting into old school and start buying older pieces, you may actually find that some of your big cupcakey petticoats just straight up don't fit under your rectangle skirts from you know 2002 um, because this the shape was just different. But again, this is like like I said, this I think is the least important thing. I think it's an easy tweak to make if you're using a modern pattern, but you don't have to like you know toss out your black and white dress because it's got a rectangle skirt, not a trapezoid one. Um, headpieces. This is another area where I think older Lolitas were very experimental. Um, you know, we've got the traditional rectangle headdress, which is my personal favorite, and they were very popular, but they were not the only thing by any stretch. Um, Alice bows, or like the big bow in the center of your head, was were very popular. Um, twin tails, like, you know, pigtails, I think were used to be more of a thing than they are now and done with like your natural hair and not with um, a wig. And so ribbon ties or hair elastics were also a pretty common accessory. Um, bonnets were good too, but it wasn't the modern stiff kind of Kokoschnik style, almost like heavy bonnet. Um, instead, bonnets tended to be either floppy bonnets, half or full were fine, or um, Mary Magdalene and Victorian Maiden tended to make very stiff, historically inspired, almost Regency looking bonnets. They're super cute if you can find them. 
Um, but these bonnets tended to just have maybe one floral corsage or one ribbon as an uh, embellishment. They didn't have the oodles of flowers and lace that they tend to now. Um, and like, if that's your bag of chips, that's totally fine. And I actually think some of those more embellished bonnets look really cute with old school. Um, but that just wasn't super common. And then also, I forgot, didn't make it into the text, but I have it in the picture, um, a nurse headdress from Meta. And nurse and maid headdresses were pretty popular. Um, not like, you know, the only thing, but you saw like brands pretty regularly put them out. It was a very common look back in the day. Um, back in the early 2000s, especially, there was not the negative association with maid and nurse and other kind of cosplay type headdresses that I think we developed down, we developed especially in the Western community um, a couple of years down the road. Other accessories, um, aprons, kind of tying back to what I mentioned earlier where the maid cosplay type look was not really looked down on. Um, aprons were super popular, especially heart-shaped aprons. Um, Baby, Meta, AP, Hardy, all of the major brands have put out um, as some type of apron with like a little heart bib over the years. That look was like especially popular for a hot second in the early 2000s. Um, arm warmers and leg warmers were also pretty popular, especially in, um, not so much in sweet looks, but especially in gothic leaning looks. Um, you could see, you can find like some striped black and you know red or and black and purple arm warmers and leg warmers in some coordinates. Um, plush toys and teddy bears were very popular. Um, this girl here with her little panda on the chain is kind of my personal hero. I hope she's happy now. Um, but she's got like a little panda handcuffed to her wrist and then the other handcuff is around the panda's neck. Um, jewelry was common, but again, it was not the AP plastic jewelry of today. Um, in general, AP or jewelry was like pretty limited to like, you know, one or two simple like gold or silver necklaces. Um, you could see some chokers like this one with like just a little bit of lace. Um, and it was pretty common for Lolita's to mix in like high brand jewelry like Vivian Westwood or um, Jane Marple's like VW style knockoffs um, were also super duper popular. They did a lot of like crown and orb and kind of British imperialism themed um, jewelry <laughs> um, that was really popular. And they were kind of the only game in town for novelty jewelry for a while um, before Baby and AP really got into it. Um, and then socks, knee socks were the most common um, with or without lace tops. They weren't the only thing. Tights, crew socks, over the knees were also worn, kind of depends on the coordinates. Um, but the designs were a lot simpler. They're now, you know, every single brand has their digitally printed tights and over the knees. Um, that was just, there. I don't think really many brands had the capability to print those in the early 2000s. So they were not common at all. Um, instead, for tights, it was mostly lace design or fishnet. And generally, that was like just for gothic. That was not very commonly seen in sweet coordinates, but you could, you know, you could do it. Who cares? <laughs> and then sock designs, it, same, you know, there, there were not in general the complex knit socks. Um, Jane Marple and Milk were kind of starting to get into this towards the end of the 90s. Um, but it was more common to see simple designs like stripes. Um, or polka dots. And if you did see a more involved design, it was generally like a cross or a crown or florals, um, things like that. Not, you know, oh, I have socks and they've got stripes and unicorns on them. <laughs> um, and this is an example, I think of, um, this is an example of a new pair of socks that Baby put out like just this year. Um, and it's the simple like knee height with the crochet lace is a good, it gives you a good idea of what um, of what socks back then would have looked like. I'm pretty sure they've just been re-releasing these socks for the last 30 years. Um, so shoes. So Lolita brand shoes were really not common at all. Um, I don't, most brands didn't put out, did not consistently put out shoes every year. And when they did put out shoes, they were, there was a very small quantity of them. So it was pretty hard to get your hands on them. So people didn't wear them. 
um, pretty much, you know, just as Lolita's now mix in mod- pieces of modern fashion with Lolita. Um, Lolita's in the late 90s and early 2000s mixed in shoes that were trendy and popular at the time to Lolita. So platforms, especially on the more gothic side of the fashion, although this was in Sweet too, um, platforms were very popular. Um, Demonia was a very popular brand. Um, they are still popular. There are some other brands that are still around like Yosuke um, and Queen Bee as well were popular platform brands in the early 90s. Um, for just like most generic, sweet and classic looks, low-heeled Mary Jane or ankle strap shoes that had a square toe were also very popular because those were just the most popular types of women's formal shoes at the time. Um, brands like Dr. Martin's were, Doc Martens were also super popular because they were popular in the 90s. Um, the T-strap Mary Janes that you can see in a ton of old street snaps, there's these and there's like one other style that's everywhere. And then um, just the classic Doc Martens boots. If you flip through like an old Bible, you can see tons of different examples of Lolita's wearing Doc Martens. They were really common. Um, and if you're kind of in doubt of like, oh, like I want to you know, really get like some shoes that are old school, but I don't know where to start. Something with like a wood looking sole is a really easy place to start. Um, Vivian Westwood's rocking horseshoes were extremely popular. Um, they were also really hard to get in Japan in the 90s and early 2000s. So Jane Marple made tons of rocking horse knockoffs. Like for, honestly, for a while in the early 90s, Lolita was mostly Jane Marple and Milk. And Jane Marple was basically just a Vivian Westwood knockoff brand <laughs> um, with lots of like tartan suits and kind of British style detailing. Um, if you don't have the money for Vivian Westwoods, that's okay. There are so many knockoff wood sole shoes you can find. Um, Meta periodically comes out with some. Um, there was a pair that Shelley's London came out with that everybody bought from Nordstrom in 2013. Um, if you want just to reliably know where you can go to get pairs of wood sole looking shoes, Antina and Angelic Imprint make very cheap options in a massive range of sizes. I believe they go up to US 12. Um, and they'll do custom colors, custom heights. Um, so you can really get exactly the things that you want, um, even if you know exactly the thing that you want was last produced in 2002 and you only know about it from an old Bible. Um, bags, so simple bag shapes were the most common, like tote bags or like the printed Moitié tote bag in the bottom or um, backpacks. Uh, common materials were pleather or canvas um, with screen printed detailing and it, not the same ornate fancy pleather that AP does now where there's multiple sewn on details. It was generally a single shape with a simple screen print. Plush animal bags were also very popular. Um, one brand made, called La Louise, which is still knocking around today, um, produced bunny shaped bags for Meta, Putumayo, um, and a couple of other brands as well. Um, and they are very easy to find. Well, not very, they're pretty easy to find. Um, La Louise still makes them every now and then so you can find them very easily. Um, the girl up in the top just has like a generic plush bag. Those were also pretty common. Um, high brand bags, particularly from Vivian Westwood were also really popular. VW in general was very popular and influential for old, old school Lolitas. Um, so if you just want to buy one $50 used VW bag and wear it with everything, you wouldn't be too far off what old school Lolita's did. Um, and there were novelty bags, um, but n- not like there are now. Novelty bags were kind of, there were two main brands producing them. Um, there was Jane Marple, which, you know, what they actually put out varied from the season. Um, one year they did like a bag that was angel wings. The next year they put out a tartan guitar shaped purse. So kind of all over the place. Um, and then there was also a brand called Patchy that made bags for Putumayo and a couple of other Gothic brands. And they were the big Gothic novelty bag uh, brand in town. They made, they were very popular for their coffin shaped bags that had little like detachable wings that you could take on and off. Um, one of their bags is just a coffin that's like probably yay high and I really want it. <laughs> um, and bags could be big or small. I've seen there's coordinates that have just a little simple pochette um, and the, you know, the girl's like hiding her shopping bag behind her petticoat that's carrying all of her actual items. And there's others where like, you know, the girl in the front has a tote bag 
the girl with the bunny has another little backpack on her back. So it kind of anything goes. Um, makeup. So in general, it was in line with early 2000s trends. Um, anybody who was alive in the early 2000s, um, you know, I have to pay respects for that because makeup sucks. <laughs> um, it, it was generally very thin brows, coal liner, frosty shadow. Um, you can kind of see a couple of those going on here. Um, in Gothic, it was more common to have a dark lip, um, heavy liner and dark shadow. But again, it was pretty like toned down, you know, it wasn't full glam makeup with a heavy highlight and false lashes and lots of contouring was not common. But in line with my disclaimer, makeup varied a lot. And in general, I think makeup is probably the least important in terms of like looking authentically old school. Um, you should wear whatever makeup like makes you feel comfortable. Like right now my makeup is not really old school accurate. You know, I'm wearing like dark matte shadow um, that's like very pigmented. And that was like not something that was easy to get in 2000, you know, so. Um, hair, as with makeup, I think hairstyling was very flexible and varied in general. And I, I don't want to say this is, I don't want to say this is gospel, but in general, it was either natural hair or a natural colored wig um, and or natural looking wig where you don't want like extreme lengths and texture and volume. Um, and most of these had natural hair and natural, natural colored hair and natural colored wigs. So like brown, black, blonde in that range. Um, there, there are examples of people having different colors, but like up until probably like 2007 or 2008, unnaturally colored wigs were very hotly debated. debated. Um, lots of Lolitas just thought that wasn't Lolita at all, but people wore them. So like, I think, you know, hair as with the makeup, you can get away with a lot here, you know. Um, I think any hair's length and texture can really work for old school. You just have to make sure that you style it in a way that it shows off your hair accessories and makes your face look cute. Um, but I do think that newer styling techniques and like it, it looks that you can only achieve with newer appliances do look a little incongruous. Like beachy waves, maybe not the best option for a mini hat. I could see like I could see it working, but I think it might not look the best for every circumstance. And you know, likewise, like an extreme like ombre balayage might look a little out of place with some coordinates but for the most part, it doesn't matter. And if you're wondering about like what popular hairstyles were, um, Hime, the Hime cut was extremely popular. Um, bangs were not a necessity, but a lot of people did have them. Um, and a lot of people had the Hime cut, which is like bangs straight across the top and then little forelocks cut to about right there. Um, ringlet wigs were also very, very popular. There was one particular brand called Maple that everybody bought their ringlet wigs from. Um, yarn, colored yarn extensions were also pretty popular in like the more fruits end of Lolita where people tended to mix and match brands a little bit more. And they were also more popular in Gothic. Um, I think you could wear them with sweet and it would look really cute. There just aren't a lot of examples of people doing it. Um, and then in terms of like popular natural hairstyles, um, I think it was, you know, again, the Hime cut was very popular. And then like anything twin tail adjacent. So like two high ponytails, two braids, um, two pigtails, anything like that was extremely, extremely popular. Um, so now where to buy old pieces. I don't want to turn this panel into a, you know, how to troll Mercari panel. Um, I'm just going to give you like some very general advice here. Um, I find nowadays with the old school becoming more popular, um, the best place to get old school at a reasonable price and in good condition tends to be Mercari. Um, I, for whatever reason, I have the most luck there. It's a Japanese selling app. Um, you can access it via the web. Um, you just have to type, I think it's like mercari.com slash JP or something like that. Um, and they have categories for all the various Lolita brands that you can search by just typing them in in English. Um, it's pretty easy to use. You do need a shopping service. Um, and I would recommend, it, it, and this is just a general tip for Mercari as for other selling apps, I suggest checking it 
after people get home from work in Japanese time. It's generally pretty dead, you know, while people are asleep and through most of the morning and the early afternoon, people really start posting things around, you know, five o'clock Japanese time in the evening. They stop posting things around um, seven or eight in the evening. So, um, or no, kind of later, probably eight or nine. So, you know, you want to try to time it to get that window. Yahoo Japan auctions, although it has fallen off in popularity in recent years, um, I think is another place where I generally have a lot of luck finding old pieces. Um, I have gotten like so many just crazy rare things for like $5 on Yahoo Japan because nobody ever thinks to look there. Um, Frill, like Mercari, is a Japanese selling app. Um, Frill, I, you can find some stuff, but I think Frill is just less popular, so people post there less. Um, it's like, you know, going to EGL com sales today. People may post stuff, but there's not as much of it. Um, and, you know, so you're just not going to have as much luck. Same with PayPay. It's a new, um, it's a new selling app by the people who do Yahoo Japan. Um, because it's so new, people aren't really using it yet. I have bought like one or two like cheap things on there, but it's not really worth checking every day. Um, Enbok is out there. It's another Japanese auction site. Again, I haven't found things on there for a hot second. So, um, lace market, you can find stuff, but uh, I think lace market is very difficult because they people because old school is more popular. People see an opportunity to make money, and people will often just resell items they have purchased from Mercari in Yahoo Japan closet child and so on for very high prices. So, you know, look there, but just don't get your hopes up too much. Um, and then also, I didn't put this on the slide, but I do want to mention it. There are some secondhand shops um, like Closet Child and Wonder Welt. You can find old school pieces there, but because they are both such popular sources for people to find clothing from, things get snapped up like that. Like I haven't managed to score something I wanted on Closet Child for like six months. You know, that's just how it is. So, and last, you know, I would suggest talking to your friends, people in your comm. Um, a lot of the time people who have old school and want to sell it, I know at least for me, you know, I'm not like necessarily selling stuff to make a huge profit. I want to sell stuff to somebody who's going to like it, who I can trust not to resell it and jack the price up, who I feel like I'm is not going to take advantage of me. So I am more likely to sell things to people in my community if I know that they're looking for things. So, you know, don't be afraid to like put your wish list out there or let people know that you're looking for something um, because people will definitely, people will help you out if they can. Um, most, especially I think in old school in kind of the old school universe, most people know each other. Most people are pretty friendly. Most people want to give it, lend a hand. So take advantage of that. Um, now where to buy new pieces that look old school. Old school is very restrictive in terms of sizing, um, especially if you are plus sized. So I wanted to try to do a focus on some places where you can buy old school looking items that are nice quality um, and where you're not having to get it altered or you know, wear something that is not does not feel comfortable for you and that you don't feel good in. Um, Sweet Mildred, whose skirt I'm showing over here, um, is a US based brand. They do a lot of pieces that are like you know, plain cotton or simple commercial prints or tartans with cute eyelet lace. Um, it's my understanding that they also do take commissions um, from time to time. And I know several friends who've gotten super cute old school pieces by just reaching out to the seamstress and letting her know what they want. RR Memorandum is um, another great brand. Their focus is exclusively on making old school pieces um, and they are UK based. Um, they're pretty new, but they've the collections they've put out so far are super cute. I really love them. Um, and I think they're a great one-stop shop if you're like, man, I kind of want to get started in the old school, but I don't really know what to do. I don't know what to buy. Go to them and you can buy like a whole coordinate from top to bottom. Um, Penny Bun Lolita is an upcoming Lolita brand based in the US. Um, and they focus exclusively on making old school pieces. Um, their pieces tend to be more like old school AP or old school classic, and their specific focus is on making plus sized items. They haven't launched yet, but what I've seen of them so far is super cute. I am very regretful that I am not in their intended size range because I really want to buy some of their stuff. So please buy some of it for me and look cute as heck in it. <laughs> um, 
Mam is an example of a Japanese brand, um, one of the few that really does extended sizing. They have a lovely sized line that's basically, they call it lovely size. It's basically plus sized. Um, they make adorable old school stuff. Um, and Mam has been producing Lolita since the early 2000s. They're basically just reproducing their old designs. They're super cute. Um, the sizing is very flexible and reasonable. So I would definitely suggest giving them a look. Um, baby is actually another surprising example, um, especially if you are looking for something expanded sizing. I know that's not their usual thing, um, but Baby periodically re-releases their old school designs as part of what they call the classic series. And several of the designs that they periodically re-release, like um, the Shering Princess dress, for example, which they put out at least once a year, um, has full shearing. It's super comfortable, can fit a massive range of sizes. Um, La Luis is the brand I mentioned earlier about um, where they sell bunny bags. You can find them on like just random Japanese websites here and there. Um, and they put out collections kind of erratically, but they're a great place if you want to get like a tacky Rochelle lace covered bag. Cannot recommend them enough. Um, Spica is the company that used to make brands for Putumayo and they're still chugging along. Um, their website looks like it was last updated in 2001, <laughs> um, but they're a great place to go if you need um, pleather mini hats or any old school bags, pleather nurse hats, um, just any like weird old school thing, accessory thing, they will definitely have. And then the last two, Darkstar Island and Crucis are a couple of Taobao brands. Um, they do have a small range of sizing, although not as big as the US and Western brands and Maxis and Mam. Um, but there are a couple of Taobao brands that have recently been putting out cute collections with, I think, fabrics and lace that read as being authentically old school to me and that you can style in a very cute old school way. Um, and so for those of you who are crafty, um, they, these are a couple of suggestions where you can find patterns for old school pieces. Um, Gosurori and the Gothic and Lolita Bible um, often have dress patterns. Um, they go up to Gothic and Lolita Bible is usually one size fits all. Gosurori, they go up to a Japanese L. L. Um, Otome no Sewing is another resource you can use. Um, they Their sizing is smaller, unfortunately, than Gosurori, um, but they are still being produced, so they're easier to find. And you can order those internationally from bookstores like Kinokuniya. Um, and Otome no Sewing is great because most of the patterns have actually a good silhouette for old school. And with a couple of material tweaks, you can make stuff look authentically old school. Um, Cut Slash Sew is a US-based company. Um, they make Lolita, they make a, kind of a variety of J fashion patterns, but they have a lot of cute Lolita patterns that I think would, with the right fabrics and materials, be great for old school. Um, you might have to do a little creative thinking because the, the examples on their site are very modern sweet, but that's not hard. Um, and then last is a very new project, um, but it's called the Lolita Pattern Archive Project. And it's run by Miss Carol Bell on Patreon. And she is, she has a software that allows her to digitize and then resize patterns from the old Bibles and the old Gosurodis. So that is her current project is posting these patterns and making them available for everybody. I would definitely, I have no affiliation with her. I just really love that she is doing this project and I really want to encourage everybody to support her on Patreon. Um, one of the backer rewards are actually, if you subscribe to the highest tier, you get printed patterns. The middle tier, you get digital patterns. Um, so it's a great resource if you want these Gosurori or Gothic and Lolita Bible patterns in your size and you don't want to have to order the physical book. Um, okay, and there's, that is it. So um, let's get out of this guy. Okay, so um, so now I can actually see your um, your questions. So if you have questions, I am happy to answer them. Um, let's see. So Madeline, no, I have. Let's see. So if, if if you have any questions, please feel free to toss them in, and I will um, answer them. Okay. Also, just for reference, with the cut sew patterns, I was not aware of this. Apparently, there is some drama, and also the patterns took a lot of alteration. So maybe don't use those. Um, yeah, I don't want to. I don't want to support that. So instead, I would suggest going to support um, the Lolita Pattern Archive Project on Patreon, and then that way you can support somebody who is doing good work and get some patterns in your size without the drama. Um, so yeah. Um, and then thoughts on bodyline old school starter packs. Okay, so 
this is just like, this is my personal preference. I don't like to recommend body line to people um, just because of all the drama with Mr. Yon. Um, that said, I do think that their old school starter packs are in, they've been putting those out since 2004. Um, so I do think they are accurate for old school. They are generally decent quality. They look pretty cute. Um, I think it's a great way to kind of like have a coordinate ready to go. Like I said, I, I personally generally don't recommend them to people, but that's like a personal thing that is not like, oh, body line's bad and don't wear it. Um, so please do not take it that way um, at all. And then um, do I have any general suggestions on things to avoid? Poly chiffon, I think is the big one that I see people doing. Like um, lots of poly chiffon and embroidered tool lace I think are the two, if you want a good, want to get something that is an old school look and you want to go beyond the basic, okay, I want to wear black and white. I think, um, I think that avoiding poly chiffon and avoiding embroidered tool lace are probably the two easiest things to do. Um, and you can just go for like, if you have a dress and you like want to change lace, you can like rip it out and put in some eyelet lace or something instead. It's super easy. So, um, what is my favorite iconic old school dress? This is like asking me to pick my favorite children. I don't like it. <laughs> um, for a, so I guess hospitality doll is, I think hospitality doll is probably like my fav, my like most beloved one and the one that has the most special um, memories attached to it because that was the initial dream dress that really got me into Lolita. Um, like I saw Hospitality Doll and that was the first thing time that I thought to myself, Lolita is a fashion that I can really wear and I just, I don't have to just admire it. Um, but in terms of favorite iconic piece, my other favorite iconic piece, I guess, is probably, it's going to be a weird deep cut, the Jane Marple like 1993 Christmas one piece where it's like, one piece with a little collar, top to bottom, faux fur, Peter Pan collar, short sleeves, drop waist, pleated skirt, and then big fur pom-poms marching down the front. Why? Who knows? But it's it's beautiful. I love it. <laughs> um, personal question. Do I still have any original pieces for my early wardrobe? Okay, so I... So when I first started wearing Lolita in 2006, I think, you know, like everybody else, I had a really dark Ida phase and it was like bad. No, it's not a sore spot. It's just like kind of funny. Um, it, my Ida phase was like, you know, oh, I bought a Hot Topic tutu and then I put it under a dress made of a tablecloth that I got off of Etsy. And I was like, yeah, I'm Lolita. Um, so I don't have any of those original pieces. Like all the stuff that I had from 2006 to 2008, I donated because it was just very low quality, not really Lolita. It made me very happy at the time and I felt so great wearing it, but like, it's just not my style now. Um, and then as for my earlier wardrobe, I actually moved in 2012. I moved states and so I sold a bunch of stuff and I only still have one dress that I had prior to 2012. Um, it's just kind of how the cookie crumbled. So, you know, it is what it is, but still love you. <laughs> um, what old school Lolita piece is my white whale? Mm, let's see. I think it's probably angelic pretty, like this is honestly kind of a basic answer. Um, it's angelic pretty. They did they repeatedly re-release this. Like it's just a simple tartan OP with heart pockets and corset lacing and crochet lace. And I have been trying to buy one since 2007 and every single time hey. <laughs> somebody beats me out to it. Like I'm always like, somebody will send me a link and then I'll wake up 20 minutes too late and it'll have sold or I'll email my shopping service and it's sold, you know, stuff like that. So <sighs> But maybe one day. And also, you know, I, I have a lot of clothes. I, I think I'm kind of at a point where I'm trying to kind of cut back and focus more on enjoying what I do have. So um, what do I suggest if I want to buy? Well, okay, so I guess, I'm sorry, I'm going to ask for a clarification to your question, Sundere Lolita. So is it in terms of like, you want to figure out like, 
you want to learn more about the dress and know the measurements and stuff like that, or you want to, um, or you're just like not sure like where it's from about dating it. Um, cause I guess those are two different questions. I give you an answer to both of them in terms of like figuring out measurements. Um, I think, well, let me answer the dating part first. So I think probably the first step is like learning how to date things I think is very, very helpful. I would highly recommend taking a look at, um, Rain Dragon. She has a Lolita brand tag guide and then Naomi Apricot, who, whose website I think is how becoming an angel or how to become an angel on Neo cities. Um, also, Megan is right. Take it out to dinner if you want to date it. But if that's not an option, um, check out Megan's tag guide. Um, in general, brand tags did tend to change throughout the years with a couple of exceptions. You know, baby's tag, uh, they used to be called Spiritualité Shining Heart for a hot second in the 80s. And so they there are a few items with that tag, but otherwise they've had the same tag since their inception. Baby's a little tricky. The AP has changed their tags over the years and they used... Um, they used, uh, they stopped using, or they used a very di like distinct series of tags from like their founding till 2009. Meta, um, likewise, they used this like very tiny tag with like a curly font for their oldest stuff. Um, and then, um, and I think, I'm trying to think of like the other, and then Jane Marple, um, which I know Jane Marple is like my weird old school obsession. Sorry guys, you're gonna hear a lot about it. Um, Jane Marple, if you want to look out for like 90s, early 2000s, they used um, either a tag that is white with white text, not light blue. Light blue started in 2007 um, or white or cream with a red text. And occasionally, very rarely, you will find a tag that is like uh, all caps black. Um, and those are like the old Jane Marple tags. And so if you like once you start looking at the tags, you can kind of date it. Um, once you start looking at the lace, the trim, the fabric, you can kind of date it because AP, you know, they switched from using generic cotton to custom printed cotton before they switched to old school, uh, to old school suite. So, um, oh, and then, yeah, Metamorphos also did used to have a, uh, they used to label their accessories Manifest Ange, and that was like pre-2003. So once you have it dated, um, then I think that's like usually a good point to go to the library, look for other dresses released by that brand from the same year, and then you can compare the measurements, and then that will help you kind of figure out, okay, is this going to fit? Can I wear it? You know, and so on. Um, how to spice up a cord and avoid using too many solids. Okay, so, um, well, <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm wearing all solids. I, th I actually really like all solids. I think it's very cute. Um, I think if you want to spice it up, though, you can change up the textures. So, like, you know, my dress, like, I've got Rochelle lace and shearing combined to give a little bit of visual and textural interest. So combining um, combining chiffon and cotton or different kinds of lace or adding in, like, different ribbon details can be a way to kind of spice things up a little bit um, without, you know, having to break the monochrome look. I think especially, like, velvet um, and tool were really popular in old school. So it's a great way to um, change things up. And shoehorn the striped socks, please. Literally begging striped socks to make a comeback. My dream. Okay. And oh, and yeah, yeah. If you have any like old dresses, you can also just like hit me up on Instagram. Like I will try to help you date them if you want. I like doing it. It's fun. Um, Megan and I just like trying to find old dresses. So, anyways, I think um, that is all the time that I have. But I really appreciate everybody coming. Um, if you like have any questions or concerns. Um, I wasn't able to hit in the panel. You can feel free to hit me up on Instagram anytime where my handle is Purist Maiden. I will, I love talking about old dresses with people. I love getting excited about old school with people. I will not be mad at you. I will want to talk to you and I will be really excited that you remembered me and came to my panel. So <laughs> thanks everybody for coming. I really appreciate it. And um, oh my God, which panel is next? Please enjoy the remainder of our programming. I know we're going until about 1030 tonight. And up next is DIY with Paradise Rose Shop, um, making fairy case star clips. They're super cute. Get those clips. Anyways, thanks everybody. Bye. <laughs>
Cloudberry Lady is a Finnish Lolita fashion label specialized in millinery. Cloudberry Lady creates high quality garments and headwear suitable for all Lolita styles. In addition to ready-made items, the label also offers custom-made headwear and garments for all sizes. For Sea of Serenity, they will be releasing Moonlight Dance Print Blouses. For the Mermaid fans, Cloudberry Lady will also release a special Adela, Arista, and Aquata print skirt. You can find them on Instagram.com slash Cloudberry Lady and at Facebook.com slash Cloudberry Lady. The Black Ribbon is located in the San Francisco Bay Area and utilizes local factories as well as smaller productions that are made entirely in their own studio. They produce small batch runs of clothing inspired by their favorite eras in fashion. For Sea of Serenity, they will be releasing their fall collection, including Cafe Gobelin Waists, Anna Classic Skirt, Forest Friend JSK Skirt, and OP, as well as other items like the Damask Blocked Kimono and an Apple Picking JSK pre-order. You can find them on their website at theblackribbon.com or at instagram.com slash theblackribbon.com.